all know that uh, Angelus has set up this series with very different architects coming in and speaking. Uh, last week we had, uh, or two, two months ago, we had Keith York who talked about uh, La Jolla history and the history of architecture. And it's very interesting, but it wasn't the way I saw La Jolla history. I grew up here, and to me it's a lot of personal memories and watching buildings come and go and ones I recognize and ones I don't. Um, then we had, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the historical, historical work I've done, uh, but also in terms of memory and my own personal relationship to the projects, uh, not in a historic, uh, strictly historic architectural point of view. Uh, last month we had Safdie and Rabinez, and they talked about uh, their work in a very contemporary environment. So in considering how to approach my work, uh, or approach any kind of architecture uh, and compose a talk, one has to consider uh, what, what angle to come from. There's a, a sociological point of view, uh, an engineering point of view, a planning, uh, an economic, uh, an aesthetic, historical. It's, it's, architecture has so many ways to be looked at that uh, I, I settled on, as I said before, Historical, and there's so many different people here. There's doctors and psychologists and architects and uh, lawyers and designers and every contractors. Um, so I'll uh, begin with what, what we have on the board: are a few projects uh, that I'll go into later. Uh, the first one's the Corey House in 1906. Uh, which had moved to La Jolla Boulevard. The second one's a Capri, which is a house on La Jolla Boulevard, which is on La Torrey Pines Road, which was torn down. It was built in 1908, but rebuilt for uh, Mrs. Harl Montgomery in a new, new version. And this is the Tuttle House on Park Row. The Corey House was really a straightforward uh, historical renovation. We took the house, uh, moved it. It was on Eads Street. Uh, aluminum siding and worn down. And we moved it over to La Jolla Boulevard uh, and set it in this complex, which was first designated by Pat Shacklin uh, in the 1980s as a historical site. They had a duplex on one side and a yellow cottage in the back and a uh, studio over the garage. Uh, this was an early sketch I did to try and understand the colors and what it looked like. It's a watercolor. A couple early measurement drawings, how it could fit on the lot uh, with the other buildings. That was the assemblage of three buildings or even four buildings on that lot was, was what was most interesting to me. How do you combine two Victorians, a craftsman, uh, on a busy street? Here it is on its way over. <laughs> there we laid it out and dug the foundation trench before the house came and then rolled the house over the trench and sat it down on blocks and then dropped plumb lines down into the, the foundation trench and built the foundation up so it matched uh, perfectly. I'd done it once before and we were six inches off, so this time we did it this way. Uh, then we dropped it down and bolted it in. There it goes. And there's what it became. So in order to get it to this state, <laughs> we had to really gut the whole building, take off aluminum siding, repaint, rebuild, uh, reconnect, uh, rebuild the whole new front porch. It had fallen off pretty much during the move. And we have the, a lot of cornices and little uh, moldings rebuilt or stripped and uh, sanded and put back on. Uh, had to connect it to the site. Uh, with a white picket fence that the owner really wanted. And then, <laughs> and then a green one connecting it again. This has to be connected to a craftsman and to another Victorian. Uh, here it is from La Jolla Boulevard. Uh, here's some of the moldings uh, and the colors on the, um, on the roof. What's exciting about a Victorian is it can, have, it can be super, very superficial and silly. But it can also have a lot of fun and uplift in the, in the shapes, whether they're spirals or uh, 
towers or whatever. And this one we had color to play with. And uh, it's what gives it its, its sort of appearance, its uh, unique quality. Inside, the inside was gutted also, and it was full of asbestos. Uh, we had to reseal it, rebuild it. The owner had a few little pictures of, uh, from a magazine of an interior she liked, and it happened to be from a William Morris house I liked in, in England called the, uh, the Red House, designed by Philip Webb. And so I got to play with uh, some of Philip Morris's design themes to create this loft space and uh, the stairwell and a two-story inner living room area with a loft above. So outside again, the question was color. How do you find the color? You can do a watercolor, you can pick chips, but when you take it to the site, it doesn't always work that way. So here I got on a ladder and kept trying different colors. Went to uh, Meanly's and just picked out a color and kept trying it till I got it right. Um, you can have a cloudy day like June and the color will be completely different than a bright, sunny January light. Uh, and then you have the foliage. Here what I wanted to do was get the upper moldings to relate to the uh, the palm trees and the dates. So the orange plays off the dates in the palm trees. The green was actually close to the color that was under the uh, aluminum siding. Uh, so I stuck with the green for the whole body and made the green play off the red and the red uh, and the yellow and the yellow. And then the purple that's in between, which you don't really see, plays off the yellow. So it was a, a fun game of making colors work. At the whole time, I had to consider that there's a yellow cottage with brown and blue trim next to it, and a craftsman which wasn't defined yet in the back. So there's the three of them together. This is the Rhodes house with the craftsman in the back, and the two roofs in the front were the uh, original house. We added the two stories in the back uh, as an addition to connect the whole property. This was just a site plan. There were so many different committees and reviews, uh, coastal, historic, uh, landscaping, structural, that the paperwork on this project, I got three quarters of the way through and I realized I hadn't really done much design work. <laughs> I had to start drawing again. Here's where we cut the building in half, pretty much, to cut the back off because it was uh, built on on different stages with different porches and water heater sheds, bathtub sheds, and trash sheds, that the back was really pretty worthless. So we cut it in half, and built the two stories in the back, and left the front uh, half a story up and half a story down. And then the back became a, you know, a concrete slab at grade. Uh, and we added the uh, river rock walls to connect the property. So. A craftsman, like a Victorian, has, has a language and uh, a design style. So the windows are really craftsman windows. And the redwood trim uh, goes along as, a, as the process of creating a craftsman. Uh, inside, red, more redwood to connect to the studio above and in the back. A passage around back to the other street and into a courtyard off the bedroom to the north. Uh, there's a balcony above and uh, the front, again playing with the colors. When you do a historic building, they don't want you to reproduce the front exactly as, as the uh, addition. And in this one, they required that I had a different roof pitch. I like that because the front pitch was steep and it looks like a pair of claws or wings. And the upper back addition has a lower slope and it almost looks as you're driving along Torrey Pines Road as if it's lifting up like a bird taking off. And it created a nice effect. Again, connecting the red to the cottage but keeping it in a craftsman way. There's the roof, all the different roof pitches. The old part and back to the new. Uh, the property was owned by one family and they had a pair of twins an older girl and uh, a handicapped child. And 
in the center of the property, they wanted a communal space for all three cottages to relate. Uh, this was the big family room, which opened under a jacuzzi and had a kitchen. And uh, then here it steps up to the old house or goes down the back where the uh, quiet bedroom was for the uh, younger child. That connected directly up to the old master bedroom where the parents were so they could have access to the child and a bedroom, a bathroom off the side. So here's the master bedroom. It's really that's the old building redone. And the old doors, the old craftsman doors redone, opening on to a mezzanine between the two floors, which was, became a gallery space, and up into a second floor where the twins were, and out onto a deck. So the twins had a huge room. Uh, with a balcony, which could be a, a master uh, bedroom also. Back down to the old building, study off the side of that, and then down into the communal family room. Uh, going back, how does it all go together? Here I was trying to get the paint that would work with now two existing Victorians with two different colors. So there's a teal. and since the house was already painted, we couldn't just use a redwood uh, shingle and let it age. We had to find a color that worked uh, with all three buildings. I think the, it drove the contractor a little crazy. I kept changing colors, trying to get it right. Uh, but here's the end one. The whole time I was thinking of a, a French uh, romantic painter named uh, Nicolas Poussin, who always had very bright people in the foreground and the background faded off into uh, woods or something. So here's a Nicolas Poussin painting. And here's how I related it to the site. Here's a Bacchus festival in the front. So the color people are the Victorians having fun. And then as you drop off back into the background, you have the craftsman, which is the nature of materials, the woods, the natural wooden uh, character of the building. So there's where painting connects with architecture. This, this building uh, is off of Torrey Pines Road, uh, first built in 1906 or 8, and was, uh, became Harold Montgomery's house. And she got it from her brother, uh, Bill Garth, who got it from his father, Dr. Garth. And Dr. Garth uh, purchased the building in 1940, I think, just 40, 41, different stories. And Harl wanted to redo it, uh, but it was so close to the edge of the cliff, pieces of it falling off, uh, and the actual structure uh, falling apart, that she decided to go ahead and uh, build a new house. And as anyone here knows, building a new house on a bluff in La Jolla on unstable soil near a fault today is a lot different than 100 years ago. <laughs> so the building, the setbacks, the coastal reviews all created a, a building different than what she had expected. She was away during the design process. And when she came back, she looked at it and decided that wasn't what she wanted. And then I inherited the project and began to work with her on it to make it fit back down on the lot. and become, uh, have some of the character of the original house, which she grew up in. Uh, this is all you see from Torrey Pines, this and three garages. But down below, it's an early sketch of how he could sit, could sit on the lot. Uh, this is what she built. So there's the ecological reserve and a canyon. She had traveled a lot in her life. Her first husband was a journalist, and they had gone through the Middle East, Persia, Afghanistan, India, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen. And they, she brought back tiles and also memories of the trip. Uh, and she wanted to incorporate those in the house. So it has this uh, Persian feeling to it. These gates came from uh, India. The front door came from uh, Nepal. And above that is a a tile she brought back from Persia. The leaded win or the windows actually came from the original house, and those windows came from a remodel uh, of the Hotel del Coronado in the 30s. 
So the, we redid those where we could and rebuilt them when we had to. Um, at the time I was working on this, trying to redo something, I already had a set foundation, a lot of Windows orders. I uh, would have breakfast coffee with Fred Leapart, an architect I used to work with. And when it came to trying to solve certain problems, I noticed that the north side of the house just didn't work. And I asked uh, Paul why it didn't work. She said the original architects didn't think anyone would ever see it. And Fred's eyes popped out. He said, but God knows. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me a story of a house he was working on once where the client said it didn't matter what it looked like because they were only going to go there at night. <laughs> but uh, part of my approach to architecture and, and history is that it's, it's memory. It's your own personal memories, and it's also a collective memory of the environment you live in. You never really see everything. You always just remember pieces, and you put it together and, and build on it. And a house, more than an institution or an office building, is a place that's full of your own memories. And how you organize those or arrange those or create a house that's comfortable to you has a lot to do with uh, your projections in your, and your memories. So here's an arabesque uh, skylight that I designed uh, from her sketches and ideas of what she'd seen in Yemen and uh, its reflection on the floor. And an arabesque is really, here's the entryway from the inside, the old Nepalese doors and the, again the skylight. Um, and looking up at the skylight, this is how they're designed. They're designed, it's all interconnected. It repeats itself over and over again. Some of them create new patterns as they get larger that repeat themselves. But it's very much how, how do you think of an architectural building? If you're working on something, you're up late at night or sleeping at night thinking about how it all goes together. You know, where's the front, where's the back? Uh, how does that piece, that stair, connect to this floor, connect to that room? And an arabesque is, is very much two-dimensional, but very much uh, that sort of pattern of thinking. So here's the arabesque in the uh, ceiling, and here it is on a dome in a Russian mosque. So, and here's again, I took the same pattern and put it in the stair railing. Uh, it's a little hard to see. Uh, and the balustrades there, it's the same pattern. This is the gallery off to the left of the uh, entryway, which opens onto a sunroom. The entry again. And there's the arabesque pattern on the stairs. As you come in the house, you're mesmerized by the view out, out the window. You can't avoid it. Uh, so in um, last summer, I saw a silent film. Uh, by, it was made in 1915 for what was then the La Jolla, a La Jolla Film Society. And it took place, it was made by the residents of the original house. And it showed uh, people zipping by on Torrey Pines Road in Model T's with women with bonnets. And we had been talking about the traffic and then we saw the film and it was amazing how busy it was in 1915. It was <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the film, there was an old man, the father, sitting in a chair by the window. And it seemed like that was his place. That's where he sat all the time. And Bill Garth, or Dr. Garth, Harl's father, sat there also uh, in his place. And when I was young, I remember Bill Garth, Harl's brother, always sitting here at the window looking out. And he knew all about the ecological reserve, the migratory habits of the birds, the tides, uh, anything you wanted to know. And it was his place, his spot. Um, so he'd sit right about there. And though this has moved back from the cliff where he was sitting has fallen off by now. Uh, oh, this is a painting from musical chairs I did at the time. This is the single chair that's left. Uh, but let me go back. Uh, back to the cliff. This is a mala stone, an Indian grinding stone, which is set over the fireplace. And it was from the property. So from Bill Garth to her father, to his, to his father, to the person who lived there before it, to the Indians before that, which go back 6,000 years, someone was probably always sitting on that bluff, watching uh, or fishing or something. So it's, it's the idea that a site has a place, a place where it's good to sit, where the light comes, 
and you build and you can build a house in terms of a site in terms of learning uh, somewhat what went on in the past, but also where is it right to be? Where is it right to sit? Where is it right to walk? Where is it right to sleep? Uh, Harl, on the other hand, uh, when her father sat by the window, uh, always sat in the kitchen with her mother, which was her spot. And so I de developed the kitchen as uh, a place central, central for her. You could look out from the kitchen through the dining room at the ocean, or you could look up the coast at uh, the pier or the Irving Gill Bailey House across the canyon, or out the back uh, at the two cottages down below in the garden. You could also look uh, through the kitchen to the front door and see anyone entering the house. So it was a nice place to stand, to sit. Uh, off of the kitchen, uh, I put in this little stairway down to the laundry room, which then went into a family room, which went into a front room overlooking the ocean, which had a main stair. So this is a back stair. And the reason I put this in is there's a big difference between working on a site with a contractor and just doing drawings. This was developed on the site uh, because we could fit it in. I never could have gotten this done if I'd just done a drawing and submitted it. So we sat there and figured out how, you know, drew it on the wall, figured out how it would curve around, uh, how to hit the bottom. The carpenter made this railing himself right there. And it flowed right down into the uh, lower level and gave us a back entry, uh, a back stair. Uh, this was a side room under the courtyard, which became an office. Uh, and then from the office, you're into the courtroom. Details. Uh, one nice thing about the house is it's all plaster. It's not drywall. And that gives it a much more solid, quiet, uh, older feeling. It's, it's nice to have the solidness of a wall besides a, the kind of echo you get with a uh, drywall or gypsum board. Uh, the plasters also used, instead of using a lot of tools, they used their hands. That curve was made with the, between the thumb and the index fingers. He went down, he showed me how to do it. I couldn't quite get it right, but it was really interesting to work with them. Here, it also, um, I kept the bull noses in the curves. There isn't any molding, any crown molding, any kick molding, any trim, because I wanted uh, the shadows of the house to to move softly from the wall to the floor and around. I didn't want them to be distracted with a lot of decoration. And again, Harl had a lot of uh, artwork that we wanted to display. And she had fundraisers and family that came over. And I wanted the house to be focused on that, not on uh, the trim or the moldings. Uh, the floors were the same way. There's a travertine inside, which is polished, and the travertine outside, which is unpolished, with a slight uh, rail there for the doors. That made the inside and the outside flow very nicely together and made the design a lot quieter. Here it is again. A bit of river rock from the old house, which really came from the beach below originally, uh, on the outside garden. This was a sketch Harl had of a balconies in Yemen that she had ideas of putting it in there. I saw this also in a Louis Kahn book where he used the same idea at Salk Institute where you have the wood and the old fading wood against the solid concrete background. I did a little bit of that. We we're going to do more later, but these are some of her Persian tiles, a more new, a newer tile. Uh, that's a painting I did of Marnie, the granddaughter, in the window. That's a painting of Harl, her granddaughter, her daughter, and her great-granddaughter. Trying to make a painting work with the building, it's, which is architecture and which is what? I don't know. So, uh, so there's the house in 1908, and there's the house in 2008. OK, the next house is in the Berkeley Hills. and. This is a eucalyptus grove where they wanted to build the house behind the house they lived in. It's not on a street. It's one block, one parcel down from the street and two parcels up on a path called Eucalyptus Path, which connects to Sunset Trail, which connects to Willow Walk, and then back to the street. 
So we had to build it. The owners had, the carpenters had to carry it downstairs and along a path to get to the site. The owners like made back in green and green and lily and rice and the classic uh, Bay Area early 20th century architects. Here's some sketches of how it fits on the hillside. And there's the building looking out at the bay, going down the path. Uh, another requirement from the owner was that uh, she had a friend who would go to India and Pakistan and pick up architectural antiques. And the columns on the right and left and the doors uh, were something I had to incorporate in the whole house. And I wanted to make them structural, not just uh, decorative. So the, the front was cantilevered out and they were set in. So they do have some structural significance, but technically they're not certified wood. So I had to balance that out. Back around the back, there's a column in the front of the house with the corbels. Um, the owner is a professor at Berkeley, and he had a study at the bottom here where he could ride his bike out and down the hill. And there was the living room, and then there was the master bedroom on the top. And this is as it steps up the hillside within the eucalyptus grove. Going up the hill to the front door. Um, Another requirement was that uh, the owner's family had been dispersed with different step parents and, and parents, and she wanted to bring them all together in the house. At the time I did this painting, which she now has, of a family being tossed out and overthrown. Uh, you know, the living room, the static living room being, it was before there was a tsunami in Japan, but now I think of it that way. But it's about chaos and turning things over and trying to bring them back together. That's a little latch in one of the columns. When you go in the building, uh, the, the center entryway has a stairwell that goes up and has these Pakistani trimmed jollies, as they're called, all around it. Uh, the living room looks, goes down to the right and looks out at the bay. And then back up at the stairwell, there's one of the columns. There's the stairs. Uh, there's a guest room off to the uh, east and a powder room. And then the kitchen is the main room where she wanted everyone to come together. And it wasn't just a show kitchen. They loved to cook. And she has a very large French stove, which is always has something on it, and uh, a view of the bay, a pantry and dog door off the back. Uh, that opens onto a garden with herbs and flowers. And uh, it's really always, always alive in there. Then it goes up the stairs, which is a central part of the house. And the columns, I stacked the columns and created the corbels with the clear story above. And a lot of the doors going into the various rooms off of the stair. Clear story, a library around the second floor, an art room off the back with two girls' rooms. Master bedroom looking at the bay, one of the girls' rooms, and then back down Boom. into the kitchen, uh, out at the bay. So there's a column bolted down with a uh, steel base, which we had made. Uh, there's the same column in Nepal, and I'm not sure how that was set in. <laughs> kind of wonder. There's the base, and there's Nepal. There's the view, garden, rosemary. Uh, these are early sketches I did trying to get a feeling for the family and for the, uh, the lot and, and for the Bay Area architecture. They're just little teeny watercolors. There are some in the, uh, the room there. This is a rendering, still very, making it very playful. As this came from uh, pretty much 10L and Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> There's a green and green. There's an early elevations. The floor plan was based on a, an Indian mandala. Uh, so in the center, you have the vertical axis, a square, and a circle in four rooms, one off each direction. The room in the lower corner looked at the bay, and they wanted that skew to look straight at the Golden Gate Bridge. So otherwise, it'd be uh, a square mandala, the kitchen, living room, guest room and entry 
be in the four different directions. There is an Indian mandala, uh, front elevation, sides down the path, another mandala from India, or Nepalese, an early painting that they have, the owner, the owner outside, <laughs> uh, and then down the hill. This is the path again. So there were four columns left over. I think we used, I can't remember how many we used. Um, but back in La Jolla, Harl Montgomery thought her courtyard was too bright. And so she wanted to build a lattice structure to filter the light. I found this old photograph recently, and there's this palm frond lattice structure in the back there, and there's some of the triangle diamond windows. So I think that's what she was thinking of. So I created these Persian ribs uh, and put them on the four columns left from Berkeley, uh, and connected the front gate to the front door, and it created this wonderful shadow effect. Uh, it became a lattice work, and bougainvillea and morning glories were planted to grow up over it. There's one column. They're all hand carved and completely different from each other. Uh, there's the front door and the, uh, the shadow as it runs right into the front door. It's the door and then connects with the shadow of the arabesque inside, which I liked. <laughs> uh, and so you get this play of shadow during the seasons and during the day. It'll move uh, you know, 360 degrees or 180 degrees just through the day. And then through the year, it's different also. This column reminded me a lot of the palm tree in the back. Uh, it has a different quality than the other columns. Looking back out, we had to stain the wood so it would match columns which are over 100 years old. And we put a stain on it, which was supposed to age it in a couple of months equal to 100 years. But it somewhat worked. And then there's the lattice, there's the lattice work that we connected back to the plaster house. So you get that wood to plaster uh, combination some shadows, and her house. When I was working on the house in Berkeley, I also worked, did some work for some Tibetans in Santa Cruz that wanted to build a temple. And I'd always been interested in Tibetan art, particularly painting. So I was, uh, it was an interesting job for me. I did some sketches, but the first step was to try and get them to understand uh, Western building codes and requirements and planning. <laughs> And the first part of that was to get a geological report. Um, all they gave me were paintings like this. This is what we want. Uh, uh, I did something like this. But it turned out the property was right on the edge of the San Andreas Fault. And the property was riddled with uh, faults and landslides. And I found one place that was 150 feet from a fault, which is required for a public building. And it was 150 feet from another fault but the two faults were only 304 feet apart. So I had four feet to build the building. <laughs> uh, but we kept going. Their idea uh, was to build the temple on the fault, and that would tame the fault. <laughs> but I didn't think that the Santa Cruz Building Department would, have, would go for that. Uh, another aspect was that when I was rendering the building, I usually render it with light and shadow to show shapes. To the Tibetans, the building was light. It was a ball of light. So the light came out from the building. And how do you render something with, with walls or solid if it's the luminous source? This was an early rendering. And I, here's where I learned a lot about the detailing. The gorgile-like sea monsters and deer all have a meaning and all have a purpose and all have a place. The bottom floor is the physical realm, the second floor is the mental realm, and the top is the spiritual realm. And the top floor is Indian design, the second floor is Chinese, and the bottom, uh, again, is Tibetan. So I did this, these drawings trying to understand the different ornamentation. Uh, and then as it further, as the project got larger, more people got involved, and they wanted conference rooms and schools, and uh, that got awfully large. I guess that's the American level down below. 
<laughs> so, so I lowered it, uh, but it's still pretty much on hold. Uh, this is a painting. Instead of doing a uh, magic realist painting, I did a realist painting of a Tibetan doing a long life rite. <laughs> so it's a realist painting, but the subject matter is going a different direction. This is where I tried to paint a flat painting with the rug having no perspective and the painting behind the Tibetan having been flat, and then using Western light and form uh, and seeing if I could create a contrast. This one was just purely Western perspective and uh, shade. This is a temple in the Arm and Hammer Museum, or was there last fall when Michael Rotundi, uh, Santa Monica architect, gave a lecture on this project he was working on. And it's being built uh, about an hour north of Los Angeles. Uh, and he's the archi architect of, uh, of the project. Uh, this was built by a Tibetan who spent a year carving the wood and doing every little piece by hand. These are Tibetan monks making a sand painting, which is actually the floor plan of the building. Then a couple years ago, I had a chance to go to Tibet. And in a monastery in central Tibet, there was this model of, uh, of the temple. To them, it's a pure land. It's a, it's a palace in heaven, and so, uh, which they call pure lands. Uh, and so the temple is full of significance and traditional uh, ornamentation, which all has a meaning, all relates to a text, and all relates to uh, a, a teaching. This is the actual temple in southern Tibet. Uh, this is the third one. The first one was destroyed by an earthquake. Uh, the second one was destroyed by the Chinese. And this one was only finished about 10 years ago. This is an incense burner uh, right as you walk into the courtyard. Uh, this is the temple. And you go up. And this is where it's sort of like a ball of rainbow light. That's the upper part. Uh, the four sides are equal, like a mandala. This is the front. This is the south. That's the sea monster protecting it. That's the south gate. And the detailing around the gate or entry. This is the west. And this is the west. This is like a knee brace. If you look up in the corner there, you see one corner, and then you see three pieces coming off. And then off of the three pieces come another three pieces. And it builds itself up like a brace you find on the corner of a building. Uh, here we just have one piece, uh, but it's an interesting. Over there is another example, like a coral reef. This is the north side, back to the entry. Inside, you can walk around the shrine. And that's a stairway that goes up to the second floor, which certainly wouldn't meet our codes. <laughs> it's uh, more like a ladder. This is a monk on the second floor. And the second floor has the murals all on the interior facing walls. Again, the top floor is completely painted. Again, like a rainbow light. That's the ceiling. Outside, there's all these phallics. <laughs> They're good luck and prosperity and fertility. And it's something that in the West you'd never see. But that's about four feet high. And there's some that were much larger. In central Tibet, um, there was this small temple. And I had some, got involved somewhat with trying to restore it. The site was originated in, in 800. Uh, so it's at least 1,200 years old. I don't know if this temple actually is, but the site is. And it's a, a little shrine for about 12 nuns. And inside, it's completely painted on every wall. And then this is where the abbots, abbot sits, just like uh, Bill Garth or something. There's probably been an abbot sitting there for over a 1,000 years, one after the other. And those, that's her text and her drum and bell. That's the ceiling. That's looking out, uh, the clear story above. A couple nuns, three nuns. Um, the portico has paintings on it. And this is a painting of the Wheel of Life. 
Uh, it also has protectors who are kings, financial protectors, benefactors, and physical protectors, and they protect the building. So coming back to California, we have our own protectors. <laughs> Uh, this is where we are. Uh, this is a, a little cottage here on Park Row. It's almost square like a temple. It's right in the center of La Jolla. Um, it's in 19, I can't remember, I think 1998. And we moved it over uh, to the corner of the lot and rebuilt um, family room, master bedroom, kitchen, and stair in the back. Uh, so it was connected with a tower, a stairwell, and then there was a uh, widow's walk on top, which again relates to memory and seeing over things and how do you, thinking of history, thinking of the past. Um, also, there was a lot of lattice work and detailing that uh, resembled in kind what was on the front in order to connect the two buildings. There's the widow's walk. The neighbor liked the widow's walk, and she called it the great room. Uh, and so she built one. You can see the little corner of it here on her, her, her house. And then the neighbor next to her uh, built a house and put a big open porch on their second floor. So I guess it works. And if you're up on Park Row, you can see the Valencia. You can see all the way around. From here, you can almost see Wind and Sea. And this is just a small, simple, non-temple track, uh, you know, 50-foot lot in Bird Rock. Uh, which is a comfortable house, uh, thick walls and arches. Coming back to La Jolla, this is an old painting of the Women's Club. So I've showed you, shown you uh, Heritage Place with the Victorian, Harl's House, Berkeley, Temple, Tuttle House. That's my work table. There's models. I didn't put any model models in the show, so I gave you a photograph. There's a painting studio. And so when Angelus mentioned this project, uh, I remembered that I tried to think of how to uh, approach it, uh, this lecture. And I thought of what, what in La Jolla is, is historical to me. And I remembered that when the Romans came back to Rome after a campaign, they would go through the city and go through all the sacred sites and connect them as one way of remembering one place, of Rome. Uh, so I um, went around La Jolla and looked at buildings and started painting, did oil, oil studies of uh, the Women's Club of this building, of what I thought was uh, just significant, significant to me. And I put them on the wall in there with my other work. So they're about, there's a selection of them. Um, but they had to do with history and my own personal memory of La Jolla, which then uh, goes back into how do you design a house? What is the memory and character of the people you're designing the house for? How does it fit in the environment? And uh, from there you get, you get ideas, you get images, you get imagination, you sketch, and you create a building. So that's my show. If you have any questions. <laughs> Yes, I don't know. Brenda might know. Do you know when it was painted? I think it was 2009 or 8. Yeah, I think 2009. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, Matthew and I are still talking. You know, he envisioned that as a workout. And then, of course, the designer comes along. She's actually listening to the client. The client's <laughs> complaining that it's too bright in the patio and I try to bring in palms and fluff it up with you know, greenery and shadow, but that didn't work. And this was, of course, before he came up with that fabulous lattice. But the original house was pink. And the original house was pink, and so we really, the color closely matches the original house. I, I literally tried to slide down the cliff in uh, trying to get some 
old stucco that had slid down the cliff <laughs> to take the sample to uh, get it get it matched. But and and he he didn't talk to me for a few months. <laughs> He knew that it was going to be. Yes? Chosen to go. Well, the pillars are triumph. I love the lattice. I like the shadows, too. Mm -hmm. I, I also wondered where that house is in Bird Rock. I don't recognize it. Uh, Beaumont or Waverly. I get those streets confused. <laughs> um, Beaumont. And it's about, a, where? about three from the elementary school. Three oh, up. Okay. Uh, Megan, who has the Brompton Villa, uh -huh. it's her house. Oh, I know exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Ortner uh, built it. Uh, it was a uh, just a little uh, glass and wood box when he got it. Mm -hmm. He remodeled it. Yes. The, your skylight in the house. House is it? Is it, like, is it a wood or is it metal that you think of it? It's plaster. It was built with rebar and then plastered over by the plasters who did the house. And then the skylight's above that. The yeah. Above it, so yeah. yeah. And they bull nosed it in and then connected it all with the same plaster. And there's one in her bedroom also. And the skylight is, is it made out of? It's, pla it's plastic, I think. problem of the auxiliary stairway, the round one, that you couldn't have got that through. Oh, I could have, but it was something that came about later on uh -huh. when there was a space there. So, uh, by working on the site, by going every day and sitting down and working with the carpenters, you have much more, uh, you come out with a much better product. Uh, two of these, the Berkeley one a little bit, but I couldn't commute there as much. But um, the reason I show these projects instead of other projects I've done is because I got to participate in actually building them. And that makes a huge difference. So you could have, but still conceiving something on paper, and then when it's built, it, there's, a, there's a gap there. And uh, you can do that, but it's just much nicer to be able to participate. And in real life, you always have to do some adjustment anyway. Yeah. Um, where do you find the craftspeople to help you with the actual construction of some of these things? That you, you ask around. Uh, it was uh, Lewis Beecham who had, did Harl's house, and uh, he came up with some of them. And then Tom Gruneau did the uh, Heritage Place, and he had some of them. But uh, you still have to go and watch. I knew they had, they had good plasters, and they had good house movers, <laughs> but sometimes you just have to go all the time and say, no, it goes this way or it goes that way. Yes? How did the um, professor in Berkeley find you? Uh, I knew him before he'd gotten married, and he knew I was an architect. Mm -hmm. How were you able to get the Chinese architecture out of the that's the traditional way it was built. That's what uh, the original Tibetan temple, the myth, the myth goes, <laughs> uh, was visualized by a Tibetan uh, yogi who went there and, and, and visualized it for everyone to see. And he said, this temple on the top is Indian because that's where the teachings come from. And then the other teachings that they were incorporating came in the middle. So I think it's, I've, I've looked at that myself. I'm not exactly sure. I couldn't point out what was what. But that's the story. Thanks.